Good afternoon, everyone. It is my true delight and privilege to introduce to you Ray Halbritter, Harvard Law School class of 1990. Ray Halbritter is the nation representative of the Oneida Indian Nation, where he has served since 1975. He is also the chief executive officer of its enterprises, where he has served since 1990. And in these two big roles of leadership, he has led the Oneida people through an economic and cultural renaissance that is a model for the entire world. His accomplishments include achieving federal governmental recognition of the nation's traditional form of government, creating many health and social programs for nation members, building new housing, establishing education, language, and cultural enrichment programs, and as the uh, Oneida Nation Enterprises, he has successfully negotiated a gaming compact with the state of New York that resulted in the development of Turning Stone Resort C Casino, which opened in 1993. The nation's expanded business developments include the Savon chain of convenience stores, Indian Country Today Media Network, three marinas, a fishing lodge, and Four Directions Productions. Through its enterprises, the nation has earned national and international recognition and honors. These include the four diamond ratings from the AAA for the resort's luxury hotels and one of its restaurants, and two of Condé Nast Johansson's most excellent awards for the lodge at Turning Stone. In 2013, Ray Halbritter successfully negotiated an agreement settling a long-standing, very difficult conflict with the state of New York, uh, which can be very politely put in terms of past differences. It might also be turned, uh, d described in terms of conquest and land conflicts. And in the course of this negotiation, the uh, Halbritter established an unprecedented form of cooperation, government to government, which includes shared revenue, and a uh, regional exclusivity on casino gambling. So I think we may need to bring him to our negotiation program. What do you think? Ray Halbritter earned his law degree here, as I already mentioned, and his Bachelor's of Science degree in Business Administration from Syracuse University. He currently serves on several boards, the Board of Directors of the Environmental Media Association, the Harvard Navy of Americans Law Board, the Montpelier Spring Water Company Board, Mohawk Valley Edge, the Hoffman Sausage Company, and the American Revolution Center. He has also been an extraordinary leader, bringing national and indeed international attention to the very challenging issue about the names of mascots and tribes of sports teams. And on that subject, he has, I think, truly changed the conversation by putting the issue on the agenda and helping people to understand what are the painful aspects of longstanding practices. And so I am going to invite Ray Halbritter to first to come up and speak on that subject, so important, and then we will have a more informal Q&A that I will uh, be able to lead, and I promise, uh, Ray, I won't call on you as I did in your civil procedure class, um, but we will instead have a real conversation and then open it up to you. So with no further ado, Ray Halbritter. Thank you, and how amazing it is that you remembered me in your class. Uh, I certainly do remember you. <laughs> Uh, thank you for having me here. No, it's all good. It's all good. I know how much you love movies, and I do too. I um, thank you, and thank you for having me here at the uh, this uh, such an esteemed group. And uh, as an alum, it's very it's a great honor to be invited to come back here, where I learned learned a great deal. Uh, and it's an honor to be here with my former professor and and, and leader of this great institution. Uh, Dean Minow, who follows such a great legacy of other deans, uh, including Dean Robert Clark, who in 2003 was the dean when we established the United Indian Nation Professorship of Law, uh, the first endowed chair in American Indian Studies at Harvard, and at the time, the only professorship of its kind east of the Mississippi River. And we did that because we know Harvard is a place where many top legal minds convene 
and we wanted to be sure American Indian law assumes it's a rightful place and gets the proper intention and study for generations to come. And um, it's uh, very nice to be here too without the the commute I used to have, I used to be in Hall, it'd take me an hour to drive back and forth each day. And, but it did allow me to continue working with and keep involved with the United Nation business uh, a couple hours a, a day, actually, and it kept me busy, uh, not to mention my six children at the time. Uh, for, for many years, our people that were mired in poverty, uh, we were allies with this country in the Revolutionary War. We were never at a at a time when we conceded, in a sense, from a treaty of concession um, or surrender, and, and nonetheless, our people suffered with great losses after the war, despite promises that we would not, that would be always remembered, and the welfare of our Oneida people would be considered the same as, as this country, the United States. But um, a tragedy occurred in 1976 where a devastating fire that my aunt and uncle burned to death. It was an incredibly painful time and it was no longer acceptable to rely on others for taking care of ourselves, for existence. Um, and you know, without a lot of resources, you do have to seek them someplace else. But as an individual, myself, and as a people, we believed we needed to do something to exercise our own self-sufficiency, our rights, and take care of ourselves. And so the opportunity to uh, continue my education and learn more about how to do that and seeking application to Harvard was not just for my own benefit, but for my people as well. And I learned the importance of edu education from my mother and self-reliance and self-determination and responsibility. You have to do it yourself. You have to find a way to identify what, you, what yourself, and uh, no one else can do that for you. And I'll be forever grateful for those many of those life-changing lessons I learned here. There are many issues that confront American Indians throughout this country, and have for generations. And many of those we could speak about today, and they continue. But I chose to talk particularly about an issue that uh, has a great deal. Of, of value, I think, in discussing it. Our people, the United people, as members of the Haudenosaunee or the Six Nation Iroquois Confederacy, were taught by our elders to consider the effect of our decisions onto the seventh generation to the future. And how our future generations are viewed by others and how we're viewed by ourselves is, is, is critical importance to our people and the primary reasons why we drove the effort to try to get the Washington professional football team's name, team's name changed. Over the last two years, our people have gained national attention for our contribution to that campaign, asking the National Football League to force the Washington team to stop promoting a dictionary-defined racial slur. We are proud to have founded the Change the Mascot campaign, and we are proud to be one of the groups that have made this campaign a, such a success. In the last two years of this campaign, we've seen some really astonishing signs of progress. In a country that for so long has marginalized and denigrated Native Americans, we have seen sports icons, religious groups, civil rights organizations, governors, state legislatures, a majority of the United States Senate, and the President of the United States support the campaign against the R word. Changes at the local level exemplify that shift. From Cooperstown, New York, to Buffalo, New York, to Hartford, Connecticut to Colorado, communities that have for decades been using derogatory Native American mascots have moved to end that tradition in the name of equality, civility, and respect. In that local upsurge, we are hearing echoes of the early civil rights movement. That movement was a grassroots upsurge that started at local school boards and state legislatures before it built enough momentum for national change. Through it all, the forces of intolerance and the status quo sat in Washington, D.C. and resisted the march of progress until the very end. It is the same thing today. The movement to treat, our people, treat people of color as equals and stop treating us as mascots is growing every day. And those resisting that inevitable march of history are sitting in Washington insisting that they are justified in promoting the ugliest kind of prejudice. 
Back then, these forces of the status quo were sitting in the halls of Congress. Well, today, they are sitting in an NFL team's front office. But the dynamics are eerily similar. As our campaign has built momentum, I have often been asked why this campaign is so important. Typically, these questions are framed as a negative. Why are we focused on a sports team's name when there are so many other pressing challenges for Native Americans? The first answer to this question is to note that it is a false construct. The idea that opposing the NFL's use of a racial slur means we are not fighting every day for better education, health care, infrastructure, and social services for Native Americans is as absurd as it is insulting. It suggests Native Americans are somehow unable to fight for our civil rights and also at the same time fight for our own economic well-being. Well, we are fully functioning human beings, and yes, we can multitask. The second answer to the question about why we have fought so hard for the Change the Mascot campaign is about the connection between the portrayal of Native Americans and our ability to achieve the equality we deserve. Why is the campaign against the NFL's use of the R word so important? Because how we are portrayed and perceived, both by others and by ourselves, is integral to our larger aspirations for true equality. Football may be just a game, but the NFL is a $9 billion a year business and arguably the single most powerful cultural force in America, which makes it one of the most cultural, powerful cultural forces on the globe. You may love that, you may hate that, but it is a fact. In light of that, it is fair to say that for many Americans, their most explicit and direct contact with the very idea of what a Native American is, is the Washington team's bigoted name. On billboards, on t-shirts, on hats, on millions of TV screens every week, millions of people are told that we are not Americans. We are portrayed as subhuman mascots, identifiable only by the supposed color of our skin. Pretending that somehow not important is dishonest, especially when social science research has definitively proven that such mass persecution has destructive public health consequences for our families, our children, and our people as a whole. And it is not just an issue for Native Americans. Research at the university, researchers at the University of Buffalo reported earlier this month that American Indian nicknames and mascots are not neutral symbols and that their continued use by schools, professional sports teams, and other organizations has negative consequences for everyone, not just Native Americans. The researchers specifically noted that studies with mostly white samples have found that people exposed to American Indian mascots are more likely to negatively stereotype other ethnic groups. The Change the Mascot campaign is at its core about self-determination. Just like defenders of the Confederate flag, those who defend the use of the word Ritzkins present themselves as the sole arbiters of what is and what is not acceptable in 21st century America. They present themselves that way because those engineering the racial assaults, rather than uh, the targets of such assaults, have always claimed supremacy. People like Washington team owner Stan Snyder insist that their supposed right to target, intimidate, and persecute people on the basis of, the basis of their alleged skin color inherently negates the right of others to be free of such persecution. The fight to change Washington t Washington's team name, then, is a larger fight to finally say that in 21st century America that values mutual respect and civility over subjugation and hostility, that cynical assumption is no longer acceptable. The recent words of the Washington, Washington team's own Hall of Fame wide receiver, Art Monk, underscores this point. He said, if Native Americans feel like Redskins is offensive to them, who then who are we to say to them, no, it's not? That is a profound point. A nation that preferences the pathologies of bigots is one that says bigots and bigots alone get to decide that their slurs are acceptable and not offensive. By contrast, a nation that preferences mutual respect is one that says the targets of a slur get to make that determination for themselves. Therefore, the questions that the mascot, Change the Mascot campaign raise are far bigger than only questions about a team's name. One question is, what is the threshold for change? In the last year, we have seen a cross-cultural upsurge in support for the campaign to stop dehumanizing Native peoples through sports mascots. Not only have political, religious, civic, and cultural leaders taken up this cause, but now thousands of people from all different walks of life have turned out for rallies. 
It is likely that if any other ethnic group had built such a powerful movement, there would be more debate. Change would happen. So the question is, why is the threshold for change so high for Native Americans? The answer, I believe, is because that when a people is so dehumanized for so long, then they are perceived to be insignificant, if not invisible. When they do speak up for that con in that context, their political beefs, beliefs are portrayed as insignificant. They face, in other words, an even more difficult threshold for change than normal. Another question that changed the mascot question raises is even more fundamental. Which kind of nation will America be, and who gets a say in that destiny? Three decades after my aunt and uncle burned to death because a local fire department saw them as subhuman, and generations after our collective peoples were forcibly thrown off our lands, those questions are now being answered in a different and encouraging way, as a broad coalition is growing against the Washington team name. That broad coalition represents not just a campaign against a football team's name, but a recognition that people of color have a right to shape the norms and standards of this country. In claiming that right, we are claiming agency for our people, and with that agency, we'll be in a stronger position to achieve equality on every other issue. When we are seen as equals, we will be in a stronger position to claim the economic equality that for so long has been denied to us, but that we are clearly, de clearly deserve. When we're seen as equals and not just as mascots, we will be in a stronger position to claim an equal share of public resources for health care and education and infrastructure. This doesn't mean that we wait to fight for that kind of equality on the, until the NFL finally does the right thing, but it does mean that those who say the change the mascot campaign isn't important somehow believe that Native Americans can be seen as mascots yet simultaneously achieve equality, and that's a false presumption. We can only achieve true equality when we create a society that says we do not deserve to be the targets of slurs. To know how important this issue, issue is, take one step back, change the perspective and consider the opponents of the campaign. If the issue is so unimportant, if as they say it is, it's just a football team's name, then why won't the NFL just change the name? The answer to that question I fear is that those who are so committed to using this name do in fact see it as important. I fear they see it as important because they believe they are entitled to continue slandering an entire group of people, regardless of the serious cultural, political, and public health consequences of such a slander. And in believing that, perhaps they fear that any challenge to such entitlement is a challenge to their overall authority and power. If that is our opponent's perception, then it is an accurate one. As Native Americans, not we now rise, as we now rise from decades of oppression, and marginalization, we are challenging the status quo, and that will be seen as threatening to those who benefit from the status quo. The blowback we have gotten for simply asking for a change of a football team's name shows how seriously the status quo takes the threat. In that response, we should feel encouraged and emboldened. This is an exciting moment for our people. In New York, we have just negotiated an agreement that ends age-old disputes on our sacred homelands and puts us in true position of equality as a sovereign nation. Throughout the country, other tribes are making similar strides. Some have asked me how I, if I feel optimistic about the change of the mascot campaign, when there still aren't signs that the Washington team has any intention to change. That brings to mind sort of a famous Winston Churchill quote, he said, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they tried everything else. <laughs> I, d I disagree with uh, Mr. Churchill, but I, I believe history does show that Americans often do the right thing on the very first try. But beneath Churchill's glib comment is a truism. History shows that the march of progress in America may sometimes be slow, but it is consistent and we ultimately get to the moral high ground. These names will change and more broadly Native Americans will achieve true equality, not because of the benevolence of a team owner, but because a critical mass of Americans will no longer tolerate, patronize, and cheer on commodified bigotry. That critical mass is building right now and it will get here sooner rather than later, I believe. Thank you. Thank you so much, and the movement is really a model for, I think, effective advocacy. Uh, it, it is striking to me that over 115 professional organizations now across civil rights, education, 
uh, scientific experts have published resolutions, have uh, adopted policies uh, that, uh, that state that the use of Native American names or symbols um, by non-Native sports teams is a harmful form of stereotyping. I mean, that's huge success. However, the public opinion polls are still not so great. It's like 42% in favor of change. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about what might be next steps. Uh, I think that your framing of the issue in both self-determination and collective national determination is very powerful. But I wonder what you think might be next steps. What, what are the allies that are possible? It's striking to me that you're encountering what I guess I've seen in other, uh, other movements for social change, particularly the women's movement, the radical trivial. What you're calling for is radical. You're gonna undo things that are important to us. On the other hand, it's trivial, so why should you care? It's, it's this double whammy that's very hard to deal with. So yeah. w what do you think are next steps? It's true, it's a, it's a challenge, and it's always a challenge to think about ways that keeps it on the consciousness of, pe of people's minds. And because it's being the smallest minority in the country, it's easy to be ignored, and to try to get you know, yes. attention, it's always a challenge. I think it's astonishing how much attention we have so that it's a national discussion issue. I think it's, it's, it's really gotten to a place now where it, it, it actually, in the beginning, it was a question of, you know, who even heard of this? Whoever, and now it's not a question of people hearing about it, it's almost a question of which side of history will we be on? I think it's absolutely And right. so we are continually thinking about ways to to bring it and keep it in the conscious of America. There, there's, a, there's been a, sort of an organic growth to it. There are different places you'll hear that it's happening. Houston School District, they've changed the, uh, Colorado's considering a, a statewide um, yes. legislation to uh, make it uh, you know, unacceptable and, and other locations. So that will always be a challenge, but I do think that when we started this, uh, it came, my, I was inspired by a group of high school kids in Cooperstown, New York, and that's where the Baseball Hall of Fame is. And they lobbied their own school to change the name on their own, they had the same wow. name. So, you know, we're the generation that elected the first black president, mm -hmm. and, and this is a different generation than some people realize, I think. Yes. And the younger crowd that's coming up are doing things that the, the professional billionaire sports team owners and the NFL will re refuse or will not do. And I think that's what gave us the inspiration and the hope to believe that this indeed is a time that mm -hmm. can change the way people think about this issue. But it will, it's a process. It's gonna take time. Uh, events like this where people hear about it, it, it become important enough to right. be heard, right. to listen to, I think is a remarkable uh, accomplishment for, for the movement. Absolutely, and I love the point that you're making about the moving, moving the issue from people haven't heard about it to now they have to take sides. That's, that's a real success. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's, that's critical because I think that, and, and it's my belief and it's why we even started this, is that ultimately people, when they do get to the point where they almost have to make a decision, yes. some people don't, they can ignore it, but you know, for example, up uh, in Lancaster recently, uh, some of the school teams that this uh, school was going to play were boycotting, wouldn't even refuse wow. to play them. Wow. And that was amazing wow. because this comes from the younger, wow. the younger, the stu they're high school kids. And that forced the issue wow. before the school board. They unanimously approved the change. And while, of course, there were vigorous opponents to it. So, but that's the process. It's a process of development of a change in America, which I think is just astonishing for an American initi Indian Huge. issue to come to the front Huge. of this country's consciousness. The Colorado bill, as I saw a debate last week, it's clear the committee would require public schools with American Indian mascots or logos to get permission for their use from a panel of Native Americans. What do you think about that as a solution? Well, I think it's certainly a, a, a great way to begin a discussion. I mean, they did that in Florida State with the Seminoles and I, I think that um, would be a way to, to come mm -hmm. to some agreement mm -hmm. rather than either one side sort of, mm -hmm. in a sense, overcoming the other. And it takes out sort of the I win, you lose. Right. And, and ultimately, to me, the best negotiations are where everybody sort of walks away. Everybody sometimes has to take a haircut, but at least you're, you're both walking away, away and it's not a zero-sum game. So 
it's just my style maybe, but I think the best negotiations, it comes from maybe the Iroquois uh, teachings, but you try to get to a place where everybody reaches an agreement that you can live with, maybe don't fully yes. want, but it's enough that you can move forward together. Well, because it has respect at the core, then there's mutual right. respect and then right. it'll endure. So I, I know you know, but I don't think everybody here knows that now every single student in our JD program has an experience in the problem solving workshop with a case that deals with cross uh, border, tr tribal, uh, and cross deputization issues so that everybody um, encounters uh, native sovereignty, uh, issues of governance, and uh, the hope is that it will spark a lot of interest in the larger issues, uh, and it's first time this year. Well, you know, the dynamic of Indian issues, and in fact, most of the legal issues that come forward in the courts are often as a result of conflict at the local level. Yes. And so the conflicts typically are with the counties and usually the states. So those conflicts often then go to the legal forum and then you'll see Indians going in maybe after the fact, carceri is one of those issues, and going, going in and trying to get Congress to fix it. And I really would like to see a little bit of a modification in that where Indian people have a more, more active communication with the states. Yes. And I hope one day to have the opportunity for Native people to bring some of those issues to the National Governors Association. I think in our state, for example, I mean, I can, you know, we were fortunate enough to reach an agreement with the state on some very difficult issue. Taxation was a very important and difficult issue. Um, Indian people being a minority in their communities where they're located very often aren't very, aren't very powerful. They don't really participate in sort of the political goings on. They don't sit in the same coffee shops and at the same barber shops and the same, they don't socialize in the same world. And it, and it is different. When you're talking about someone and they're in the room is a lot different than when you have that conversation about them when they're not in the room. So all of these elements in how things work in our country for Indians is a process that I think is changing as Indian economic development is helping improve their ability to do things differently. They're starting to understand and interact more in a way to understand how, if you will, the other side functions. Mm -hmm. And that's critically important to when you're having a discussion or you're trying to resolve issues um, in, in that forum, whether it's jurisdiction, taxation, uh, other sovereignty rights, children's adoptive issues, whatever those might be. Well, the problem solving uh, approach that you have exemplified is really an inspiration here. Do you have uh, lessons learned about how to negotiate with state government? Well, I, th that's part of it. It's, it's really one of the things after attending the school here, and I did take a program, a class on negotiation, which was very, very helpful. Uh, it got me to under, try to see things from the perspective of the other party, which you don't always do. When I, when I grew up and in our councils, we knew what we wanted, we knew what our rights were clearly. Uh, we could read our own treaties, we could read the Constitution. Um, you know, of course, 200 years ago when those, they were made, our people couldn't read or speak English, but, so it's, a different, but it's amazing that it has survived. But understanding the other perspective and and uh, I think that was critically important to help you start to find ways and how you could navigate to a place where you both could agree. And it sounds, it sounds simple, but it really takes an effort to do that mm -hmm. because you don't always, in those contexts very often you could be, you know, we've had armed confrontations with our local police. Sure. We've had, you know, like a fire and, and the emotions run very high. Sure. And sure. that's very challenging. And you know, in some situations you can hire counselors to, to, to advocate for you. In a courtroom you hire an attorney. Right. But in these forums very often it's, it's you. You're the ones that are on the front line. You're the one that has to sit there and sort of try to get beyond all of that history to a place where you can feel comfortable and you feel that you can go back to your people and say, I did protect you. I did protect your interests. Not like before. And, and how can we trust? How can you trust after all these, this history? So. There's so many challenging levels on that, but it, uh, uh, I think understanding the other point of view, uh, believing uh, that you can find a way to reach an agreement. Sometimes you just don't think it's possible. Mm -hmm. You just, sometimes you don't want, there's so many dynamics, but ultimately I think trying to understand the other perspective is so important. 
H how important is it for, say, the state of New York to understand the history? Well, I, I, um, I, I think that it, they, they do a lot. They do understand a lot of the history, but what's motivating them isn't necessarily what's, I would say, what history tells them it should be. Right, right. They have certain goals. They have goals to have revenue. Mm -hmm. So their goals to have revenue means that they're not going to concede a tax issue. Right. You're getting a lot of customers. Uh, they're, they're not Indians, they're white people. So they're coming and they're spending their money at your place. So we should be entitled to that tax revenue. So why should we give that up? Mm -hmm. Well, the treaty says, Here's the treaty, it's clear, you know, the Constitution said treaty shall be considered the supreme law of the land. Here's the treaty of 1794, it says we should be freed uh, from just being disturbed on our lands. We mean that to be, you know, you should leave us alone, let our, well, you know, but yeah. it, no matter what the, you know, some, History often you go law. to, so often it's easy, easier for a politician to just have the conflict with you and let it go to litigation because then they don't have the responsibility for making a decision. And it's, it's oftentimes easier to just let it go. Well, the judge decided it, good or bad. I, at least I didn't. Uh, it was the judge. So sometimes all of those different dynamics really don't always work for you. Right. Um, uh, but, uh, but the history, you know, everybody can know the history, but it's almost as though it doesn't matter what the history says. It's what we need to do right now. Right. I and guess, yeah. we appreciate that you Indians did this. We appreciate that you sacrificed your lives for the United States. But, uh, you know, we just can't concede this tax issue. We need you to collect and remit money to us. So it's, it's, it can so be a challenge. Very important then to talk about money and business and the future and what's in it for you. And, I mean, you clearly figured out a way to do that, partly by building such a successful uh, set of uh, enterprises. Yes, and there's no question but in today's world, uh, politicians, who gets elected and how the, you know, the power is uh, strongly aligned with economic power. If you have money, it opens doors. If you have money, it, it creates an opportunity. I'm not saying you know, that your people are uh, doing it inappropriately. I'm just saying that if somebody is being elected, and in order to be uh, to run a campaign to be, uh, you know, you need so much money. Right. And depending upon right. if you take a poll, they analyze this to the nth degree. So if somebody wants to win a campaign, somebody will give them probably pretty good. Well, it's going to cost you probably five million because we're going to have to do this, this, and this. And I think you have a chance. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a position where you can, you know, support that, right. and. It, it, there's no question but that influences sure. the way people treat you. Sure. No, well, it's real. It's real and pra pra pragmatic and practical. Uh, we here at Harvard are you know, incredibly uh, impressed and, and uh, in awe of what you've accomplished. And I just want to say publicly how grateful we are uh, for the gift of the Oneida Indian Nation Chair, uh, which has allowed us to bring, so far, eight people, two more are coming. Um, uh, since uh, it was founded in 2003, and it's made a difference. And we've had several conferences, including, I think, a great one on tribal courts uh, and another conference coming forward. Um, and, uh, but I'm interested in your thoughts about what the topic should be. What, what issues should we put on the agenda? <laughs> For the courts? Oh, the Sheryl decision. I think that... Um, for American Indians, it's, it's a process of growth for them. Uh, they've been in communities where they didn't want to have their children necessarily be educated because they didn't want to lose that, they didn't want to lose them as Indian yes. because being an Indian person is about what's inside you. The only reason I'm here telling you that I'm an Oneida Indian is because I assert it and my people taught me, uh, my, my, my mother, my, my elders, and if I didn't, say that or do that or exercise that, I would not exist right. anymore. So no school is going to teach me that. So a lot of these communities are fearful that that will happen, sure. and it has happened. So there's a real kind of dissonance that occurs and a conflict that occurs when children grow up and start are so in a society that's not about them. And we have a history certain, of a deliberate use of schools to take away the culture. Absolutely. I mean, the boarding schools were specifically mandated to kill the Indian and save the man. And my, uh, my grandmother was corporally whipped if she spoke even one word of Indian language. So the language sort of 
stop just about at her generation. So we have a language program now and all changing that. So having said that, it's sort of like how the tragedy is that anybody occurs in their life. It's what do you do about it then? Yes, we all have tragedy. We're not the only one. But we have to do, the, we have to do it. We have to ultimately try to make that difference and stand up for what we believe and what we want our children to, to believe and know about themselves. It's what takes me back uh, to your campaign now, uh, Change the Mascot campaign, because I think you're right that for a lot of non-Indians, their first encounter, maybe their most active encounter with anything Indian is the names of the sports uh, teams and the mascots. And so these are all connected. I'm going to open it up for questions very soon. So think about the questions that you have. I think we may have a microphone. Yes, we do have a microphone that will be coming around. Um, but I have, I have uh, one more question, which is for those tribes, those nations that are not doing as well as the Oneida, what, what would be your advice? Well, it, it begins with what they, they want and how they see the goals. If, if their goals are to protect as ours were, and I suspect they are, then it's a matter of understanding how do you how do you progress to do that? How do you empower yourself? When we were, we had this fire, and my aunt and uncle were their body. We didn't even know how to take care of the bodies. They were just laying there, and kids were coming up, and the city would refuse to let anybody come to help. But we finally were able to get a nurse, a, a funeral home, to come up, and they handled that. But it's really. And in one way, people might say, well, you know, you want to be sovereign, so that's sovereignty. And it's true. Taking care of yourself. Okay. That's all part of it. So once you think about what your goals are, and sometimes it's hard to even know what your goals are. You're so busy defending what you have, what little you have sometimes. So you, you, you have to sort of sit down. And I think to some extent, it's helpful when you're able to talk to other Indian mm -hmm. leaders. Mm -hmm. how it, we are a traditional government, which most Indian nations aren't. And we still follow a traditional process to make decisions. And for many people who want to retain their culture, their language, they don't think that's possible. And sometimes they fear um, their children not keeping knowledgeable about their culture and education. I think that's more important because not only are they just governments civilly, but they also have uh, their spiritual uh, spirituality combined with that. So it's, it's hard for some, for some of the, the nations to sometimes see a way uh, through that to protect themselves. But I do think there's a process that's happening. I think even this discussion with the mascot campaign has helped bring Indian people to even think about themselves even more than they have in the past because of the attention. So I can see some very good aspects because of that. But it is a process. It's a generational process. Yes. And I do think that where you have do succeed, there's no question but those models really help others believe and believe that it can be done, believe that you can have a better life, even though we're surrounded in a society that doesn't necessarily respect ours as much as we think they should. Believing that it's possible is a critical yeah, first step. Absolutely. Questions, comments? There's, I see several. Please identify yourself. Yeah, my name is uh, Dave. I'm a 1L here at uh, the law school. Thank you very much uh, for being here. Um, in, in relation to the, uh, the the football team in Washington, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit um, in terms of any outreach you've done to some of the media outlets that that, that cover sports specific, sports specifically. You know, ESPN's uh, ombudsman has, has spoken a little bit uh, about this issue. Um, and, and how does that re relate, or how is it complicated by by sort of their treatment vis-a-vis -vis some of the uh, more tribally um, named teams that may have special relationships. Um, you know, you mentioned the you know the Seminoles at Florida State, um, or the Chippewas in, in Western Michigan, or, or the Illini in Illinois. Uh, you know, ha have you reached out to those organizations? And if so, do they need to be? You know, obviously the football team in Washington. There, there's a certain you know pejorative nature to that term, rather than you know th than some of the the tribal names that they may lack that pejorative nature, but there's still that degree of, you know, sort of otherization or objectification that you talked about inherent in, in being a mascot. So, do, you, do you see a sort of bifurcation there? And, and if, if so, how, how, do you, how do you kind of square that circle? Well, the, um, the Washington team name is def defined in the dictionary as a racial slur. Um, other names aren't. Uh, Cleveland Indians, Atlanta Braves, 
What happens is there's a disrespect, however, and a misuse of some of the cultural symbols and what is important to American Indians. And people don't know they're doing this. I mean, they're not doing it intentionally, at least not, uh, not until they know. And now that people know about the Washington team's name, it has progressed to a point where now people know it is disres disrespectful because we're saying it. So now they have a choice to make. I, I do think there's a broader discussion to be had about the use of mascotry and, and what it does to a native people and not just our people but all children because they get a propensity to be more stereotypical about other ethnic groups. This, has come, this comes from social science research. This is not a, 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 just an opinion of mine. So, um, so, but in particular, the Washington team name is, is a defined dictionary slur. It represents this nation's capital. It represents America, the rest of the world, as the NFL seeks to go international with its brand. And uh, it's something that I think that this country ultimately, uh, this generation in particular, ultimately wants to see a different America, one based on mutual respect. And I think we see that around the world, too. I think respect is the heart of so many issues that are not always stated as the issue. But the way you treat people, the way you talk about people, the dehumanization that occurs to Indian people and any people who is subjugated to slurs and, and stereotypical comments, um, we've seen that throughout history. We know what that does. A lot of people have experienced this. We know where it happens around the world. So this issue is not a small one. And, but I think there, right now our focus has been on the Washington team's name, and I think if we can succeed there, it really, and it already has helped with a broader discussion about mascot, mascots, what it is, what its real effect is to children, to our children and our future generations, including all of us. I don't think there's ever been a genocide without it being preceded by dehumanization. No, it's intentional in many cases. In order for one group to get their army the killing people is not something people just do because they're told to. You military has to train people to de desensitize themselves about what they're going to have to do because the inherent resistance to actually taking a life when that moment comes is so strong. They won't even study this in the military, but many of the people in the military don't even really try to kill the other person. They shoot over their heads or they shoot near them. They want people to think they are but they're so really resistant. There's probably 2% of the population that really can do it. I, I know it's a morbid subject, but, it's, you know, but the point is that when you want to defeat an enemy, your job, you're not, a, you're not like in a courtroom. You're there to inflict as much damage as you can to make them submit. And that, you know, there's not a lot of dipl diplomacy there. It's just one thing, and you want your soldiers. So you have to learn, and part of the dehumanization is by treating them as uh, using names, dehumanizing them. There's a couple more questions here. Please just identify yourself. My name is Tanya Lee. Uh, I'm wondering if you think the use of Indian mascots in schools, public schools, that American Indian children attend is a civil rights issue that the federal government should be addressing. Oh, I do. I do. Um, I, I think that to have children in an educational environment that's publicly supported by allowing uh, merchandise or uh, items, hats, memorabilia that has a dictionary defined racial slur violates the environment and uh, what the taxpayers and what this nation really wants for their children to learn, what their generations are. I think it absolutely is. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Dan Carpenter. I uh, teach at the government department here. I um, just wanted to congratulate you for a fantastic talk. Um, a, a couple of memories were coming up as you were speaking. I remember watching football growing up. Grew up in a small town in the Midwest, and um, and as as you were talking, in part for reasons that you were conveying, and in part for reasons that came up in my memory, the the centrality of this struggle, particularly with the Washington football team became clearer to me. Um, the traditional enemy in kind of American culture, uh, in NFL culture of the Washington football team is the Dallas Cowboys. And that binary opposition, who have a star on their, hel their helmet, mm -hmm. and who are known in parlance as America's team. 
Um, and that, that, that binary opposition between one team representing, you know, again, this racialized other, but something set up in opposition to America's team, meaning not American, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and just how that, um, and, the, and the way that those games are often depicted as kind of the battle of the Wild West, as if we were still fighting each other. Um, so, um, you know, that, and I just wanted to say, in addition, um, I think you hinted at this. Um, the more I think about this, the more I think that this particular struggle over this particular team and this particular franchise is the big domino that will help a whole bunch of others to fall. Um, and just to, you know, again, just to say, you know, thank you and, and to keep, keep up the great work. Um, I study um, petitioning, and I'm really interested in studying uh, the history of Native American petitioning. And I wanted to just throw out as a question um, what do you think can be done in part of this process of, of, you know, literally petitioning American culture, not just our government, but our cultural institutions to rethink the role of Native Americans in history, to rethink the portrayals of Native American history? What do you think can be done beyond the mascot or with the mascot uh, uh, battle to change the story, to to continue to change the story, to continue to change the symbols that are done there. One example, obviously, would be the Revolutionary War uh, uh, work that you're doing. Where else do you think we can we can push uh, on that, including universities, which I think should be part of that conversation? And tell us about the Revolutionary War work too. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I, I I think it's it's an ongoing process that American Indians really need to lead, in a way, and. I, I think they, they, they but it's, a, it's an American effort, just like the Civil Rights Movement was. I mean, some of the writers, freedom writers, they were not just black people. And, and when America pulls together like that, I think that's what's the best about America. And that's why I believe that this is gonna change because this is the America that everybody really wants. These are the ideals, even though when this nation began, while they said freedom for everyone and equality, everybody wasn't free. But in time, yes, and, it, and every day it's a struggle because it's not, we're not always there yet. We're not there yet because of this name. So I think we, we continue to make these efforts. We continue to, uh, to go out and speak to people and more and more it's becoming an organic kind of movement where, pe where it's developing almost a life of its own. It's developing throughout this country and I do think that we've really progressed in a couple of years. You know, I'm not the only one who did this issue. There were people before me, I'm just standing on the shoulders of Suzanne Schoen Harjo and Amanda Blackhorse and others who really have been leading this fight. And uh, their works, uh, of course, have allowed us to do this, but it's a work that needs to be done and we'll continue to do it. And you know, we were at the rally recently with, uh, uh, when the Washington team played the Minnesota and it was the biggest rally. Uh, there were thousands of people there and it's just growing. And, in, in knowledge and awareness, and I think, it's, I think it will change. Um, the Revolutionary War, um, our people, the United people, were allied with the colonists in the Revolutionary War. Um, we fought at the Battle of, Are Battle of Ariskany, which is the, considered the bloodiest battle of the Revolution, to help keep St. Leger from uh, uniting with Burgoyne and splitting the colonies in half, which ultimately, um, you know, Burgoyne was defeated and brought the French believed they could, we could win. We were very, had a close relationship with Marquis de Lafayette and they actually have rebuilt Mar the Marquis uh, ship that's coming to America this year, L'Hermanier. And we are going to be uh, part of that because they asked us and because they know of the relationship between the Marquis and, and our people. And uh, we didn't write the history books, so those who do, of course, but on the other hand, when you're thinking about change, we did have the resources to begin a book which is today called Forgotten Allies. It's the story about the history and what the United People did during the Revolutionary War. We, we lost a third of our population in that battle. There was a man on Yeri Dockstader who fought in the Battle of Riskany and had his wife and his son in the battle, which, you know, it's, and his wife was uh, fighting right alongside him. It's a fascinating story. Um, and, uh, but there's a book, Forgotten Allies, which would give you more detailed history about uh, the United role in the Revolutionary War. There's a hand back here. Yes. I'll stand up. Hi, I'm Liv. I'm a 1L, 
And you spoke about uh, the sort of narrative hijacking of um, people who want to continue to use redskins and want to continue to wave the Confederate flag. And I was wondering, there are many other nations um, who have endured this kind of genocide and othering who culturally have completely eliminated any remnants of, of celebrating that legacy. I think of Germany, I think of many countries in East Asia um, where it's completely socially unacceptable to wave a swastika around or anything like that. So aside from our constitutional protections of speech, do you think there's something cultural that we're doing that is not allowing us to move past this and allowing us as, an, as a nation to come together to stand by one another? Or do you think it's an issue of temporality where we've simply forgotten the damage? Well, I, I think it's, it's something that people didn't really think about. It's become institutionalized the way, I mean, the NFL is a $9 billion industry. Uh, the billionaire team owners have a lot of money, a lot of power. When we sort of took on this battle, I mean, you know, you go up against a billionaire, I mean, he can hire the best uh, ad firms in the country, lawyers, research, investigative reporters, you name it. They have ability to talk to people at media levels that we don't. I can't just go in to talk to the owner of the Washington Post or any of these media, all ESPN, but they, you know, they, when you're a billionaire, you can do stuff like this, but we knew it. That's okay. So fights aren't fought always because you think you're going to win. They're fights because you need to do it, because it's the right thing to do. But there is a growth, that, there's a change that's occurring, and it has happened. We, from when this issue first started, for people even knowing that it was an issue, to getting to where, well, why, you know, you're attacking my team, what are you talking about? Hey, this is just a game, this is just fun. To where people are now, well, whether it's fun or not, you know, I just don't feel really comfortable saying it, because I don't think any of these people, Dan Snyder, any of them are gonna to go to a, any reservation and talk, call an Indian that name. A matter of fact, I know a lot of places that's not a good idea. That, you know, the, the, the chairwoman out in uh, uh, Paiute uh, is finding that out, that it's not acceptable anymore just because they got a lot of money and they can fly you around on a plane and give you a lot of stuff. That, but it's a growth process. It takes time for people to understand this. And we know that people initially never intended to be doing any harm not realizing it, but now they know. One of the most difficult meetings I had was with NFL representatives about this name, and they were basically defending every argument you had why they should use the name. And one of the uh, representatives was uh, a graduate of this institution and a black man. And it was really very hard for me to sit there and have him defend the legacy of George Preston Marshall, one of the most avowed racists of our time the last team to integrate in the NFL and only did so under threat of the federal government because they were on government land having their games. So, but this is all part of what the struggle is. And it's a, and it's a part, I think, that we've been able to, to successfully get to be a discussion point and a knowledge point for America's consciousness and their people. Hi. Um my name's Elizabeth Reese. I'm one of the uh, co-presidents of the Native American Law Student Association here. So thank you so much for coming. This has been a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, so I had sort of two brief and entirely uh, unrelated questions. Um, the first being uh, that I, you know, particularly in the discussion, what came out was your background in negotiation. And I wonder how uh, the, Washington team name issue presents unique struggles in terms of negotiation. Um, at least I know from my own experiences having conversations about it and, and fighting, going to protests and such about it, that um, it's very hard to have a conversation where you're sort of negotiating for just respect and humanity and what's the middle ground between that end and the other side, and how hard it is to put yourself in the other side's shoes when what's in question is equality, humanity, and you know, incremental steps seems like a huge challenge to figure out um, both what they are and how to sort of recognize just taking small steps towards full respect and full humanity. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, the other question is just about being a 
native leader who's been educated at this institution. I think um, what you said about uh, the community back home sort of hearing what education does and how it changes what you think and what your priorities are um, is certainly something I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you so successfully navigated that as a respected native leader and national figure. Um, well, the, uh, the process was, was one of growth for myself, personal growth. Um, I, when I first started working with, the, with my people, I had a couple years of college, but throughout that time, and I've been in long enough where I did get my undergrad degree, then a law degree, so I sort of, in a sense, grew about how to handle these sorts of things. Initially, we had, we, we stopped the police from coming on our lands. It was a time of activism for American Indi Indians in America, a time of wounded knee, occupation at Alcatraz, the Trail of Broken Treaties, um, the, the occupation, the takeover of the BIA, I was there, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was there. <laughs> and, you know, it was just, I just, we were young at the time, I was doing iron work in Washington, and I was a fan of the team. I, I didn't think any problem was, was with the, the name at all. It was not even an issue for me. But as I became a father and a leader, I started to see what our people were doing, what the issues they had, going to schools. Uh, people used to drive by sometimes because we had land claims and throw garbage out. We were just a small group of people. Um, and finally, we had enough of the way we were treated, and we stopped the police from coming on. We had armed confrontations, many of them with the, with the local police. And, um, and, and that was part of the reason why the whole conflict escalated to the point where they're not coming on to help us. Do it. it was just a method of institutionalized, you, you know, way they did. Eventually, the Justice Department sued them. We got fire protection back. But over that process, over those years, I did change in a way I was thinking about myself and how to handle and do things, and I'd look at, you know, I'd have to sit down with the mayor, and one of their defenses by their attorney's defenses was we didn't exist anymore as a people, they're not Indian people. So it was a real funny situation, I'd sit down at a meeting with them, and they couldn't recognize me as an Oneida. They, part of their defense was I didn't exist. Wow. So they couldn't call me an Oneida, they couldn't address me as an Oneida, they, they, they would refer to us as residents of a territory designated as the Oneida Indian Territory. I mean, it's just sort of interestingly and sort of odd. <laughs> But, but that was what they were advised to do. And, and also to sit there and you're, and you're trying to keep composure and you know, with either Adolfo Birch or Mayor Brewer at the time or the district attorney who was very much opposed and, and try to keep focused. And it really sometimes is a challenge. But the more I learned, if you will, uh, the tools, if you will, of, of language, and the way things worked, it really helped me find a better way to understand. I remember a book I read, How to Win Friends and Influence People mm -hmm. by Dale Carnegie, which I recommend every, it should be mandatory reading for everybody. Mm -hmm. But I remember him telling a story that he, his favorite food is strawberry shortcake. He, he it's, if you wanna, he says this he loves, but when he goes fishing, he doesn't use strawberry shortcake. He uses worms and he hates worms, but you get the point. <laughs> I think we're going to need to draw this yeah. to a, a formal end. Uh, I'm excited that in the coming year, uh, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies will be devoting a year of study on uh, Native issues, and um, we will be planning a conference here, and uh, we look forward to talking with you about ways we can be helpful. Uh, Dan Carpenter puts on the table, how can universities be themselves a vehicle for cultural change and knowledge, and also how do universities need to respond? Oh my goodness. I have one more thing to do here. Thank you so and, much. Uh, uh, on behalf, I bring greetings of peace from our people, and I have something to present to uh, Dean for uh, uh, inviting me here. And this is a blanket, uh, specially commissioned to Pendleton. Wow. Wow. A lot of trade blankets, of course, for Pendleton. So beautiful. And um, it has a symbol. It has a little legend that'll tell you, but it has a symbol of the Tree of Peace, like the Iroquois Tree of Peace. It's all the Confederacy nations in peace in the tree. And uh, the peacemaker came and uprooted the tree and made peace among all the nations. They all put their weapons underneath the tree, and that's where the Bury the Hatchet comes from. Yeah. Not that we have to do that. <laughs> but one thing we like to do is uh, I wanted to present this to... Uh, to the dean, and uh, we, we usually will we'll wrap them with oh, this. Oh, thank you so much. A... Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, I'm very honored. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
we'll fold it up and put it back. Oh, you. it's wonderful. We have a small thing for you, not as. Oh, did, no, that's great. But this is a memento of this day. Oh, thank you. That's thank great. You so Now these these are limited edition. Not many get this, uh, but George Clooney got one. So, um, yeah. So I, d I thought I could make a hit with that. <laughs> I know you love yeah, movies. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very it's much. Really we'll fold it up. Thank you. Thank you.